last year when most investors were watching their stocks plummet. One Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage. He was identifying winning stocks with massive uptrends, like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,000%, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789%, Overstock.com before it shot up 1,000%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. Right now, you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works, a way to type in any of the 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where a stock is most likely to go next in any type of market. Simply go to chakentrial.com for your free look. Again, that's chakentrial.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 7th of July, 2022. And we got a big interview for you coming up today. Jonah Lupton, he's been in the market, an entrepreneur, started all kinds of businesses over the last 20 years. He's gonna be joining the show and he is a growth investor and he names names, folks. He's got a list of stocks that he actually has his own money and he talks about his two largest holdings. We dive into them. An energy drink, a med tech company, talks about chip stocks. All that and more coming up right now on Making Money. Welcome to Making Money with Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me here today. It's Thursday. It is the 7th of July, 2022. Another great guest on this week. A uh, guy we've been trying to get on for a while and happy he took some time to sit down with us. Uh, Jonah Lumpton's here with us right now. He spent the last 20 years, folks, as an investor entrepreneur, started multiple companies along the way. He currently runs Lumpton Capital, which is a holding company for his paid investment services that are on Substack, StockTwits, Seeking Alpha. There he provides weekly research reports as well as 24-7 access to his current portfolio, investment models, trading alerts, and market commentary. Jonah, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So let's jump into this. I mean, we just wrapped up the fifth or fourth worst start of the year ever, first six months of the year. And everything I read, right, just everything, 80% of what I read, people are still so damn negative. I'm on the flip side. I think this is offering a great opportunity. You look back in history, it is setting up as potential great opportunity. What say you right now after we, what we just went through the last six months? So I think it depends on what kind of a investor or trader you are. You know, I definitely put myself into the investment camp. So I try to buy companies that I can own for the next two or three years that have really strong fundamentals. I would love them to have strong technicals too, which they don't always have. And Sometimes you have to be willing to get stopped out of positions when those technicals fall apart. Uh, but I'm also very conscious about valuation and multiples. And I'll admit that, you know, I even when the Fed pivoted back in November and Powell said inflation is not transitory and they would have to get more aggressive, I figured that meant we would see some multiple contraction. I didn't think we would get as much multiple contraction as we got. So, I mean, you've seen... I think the average software stock go from 16 times revenues and we probably shouldn't have been using, you know, price to sales multiples in the first place. But when you're dealing with companies that aren't profitable yet or, you know, don't even have uh, positive EBITDA, it's you got to come up with something in order to compare them. So but I think the average software stock or cloud stock has gone from 16 or 17 times sales to I think now six or seven times sales. So big contraction. You know, I've seen the same thing across my portfolio. All my, although my portfolio is held up relatively well, uh, my two biggest positions are actually both positive for the year. Uh, that's Celsius and Shockwave. Uh, but you know, the bottom of my portfolio, which I call my my lower conviction names, you know, haven't done as well. Uh, I got into Uber probably a couple months ago, thinking we'd seen the lows in Uber, and it's gone down another thirty percent from there. I tried to you know, cherry pick the bottom on Shopify and Twilio and a couple others. And, you know, I got stopped out of those names within a week or two with, you know, some small losses. So, you know, I've just been shocked at how how far some of these stocks have pulling back. Now, yeah. if you're a trader, you know, you probably haven't had much of a reason to put cash to work over the last three, four, five, six months, because we've obviously been in a downtrend uh, and you're going to wait for these stocks to form a base or you're just going to chase the the high momentum stocks which were you know utilities and consumer staples and energy which were holding up the best i have no interest in those types of stocks because i'm really a long-term growth investor 
Yep. So for me, you know, I did get stopped out of some positions over the last few months. That's helped me raise some cash. So I'm about 30% cash right now, or about 26% cash after adding a couple, uh, adding to a couple positions the last couple of days. Um, but, but I'll also, I don't mind averaging into the bottom. So I do think there is a chance that, that the next 10% is lower and not higher mm -hmm. unless we see macro data, data getting better, right? Which commodities are rolling over, you know, oil today is, uh, you know, the WTI August futures contract is now under $97 a barrel. That's good. I think nat gas is down 40 or 50% from the highs. You know, wheat, copper, I mean, all of them are rolling over. Uh, mortgage rates are coming down. The 10-year treasury is at, you know, back down to like 2.85 now. So um, it's possible that the recession fears or the talk of the recession has then uh, forced people to tighten up their spending habits, which is, you know, obviously going to bring down commodities and inflation. And you've seen rent prices actually rolling over in a few cities. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's possible that, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was in the bearish camp, I guess, even though I was 70 percent invested, I was still holding that 30 percent cash. And my strategy was this. You know, I thought we could go down 15 percent lower if macro didn't improve and Q2 earnings are worse than expected. Mm -hmm. But if we go down 15 percent, I don't want to be holding that 30 percent cash trying to time the bottom with it. So I was more than happy to start putting that cash to work as we went lower in a way, almost hoping that we would go 15% lower. So I could put that 30% cash to work. Yep. And if we went any lower than 15%, that's when I would go on margin, you know, cause I'm just running my own money. Sure. That's why I'd go on margin and get really aggressive, hoping that we got like that big capitulation event where I could just go, go in really, really heavy and probably get, you know, like 50 to hundred percent leverage. Um, yep. You know, and then so once, ask, once you we bounced off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, we, we probably were in a very similar camp. We're both growth investors. We both take a long-term view. Uh, I, I, I'm saying the same thing as you. I thought, I always thought 3,400 in the S&P, which are not too far from a kind of be the level. And, you know, I look at it and it's like, okay, if there's another 10% to the downside, there could be 50% to the upside. You got a five to one. So for the long term, I, I think it's a great, you know, and I always say you, you, you got to get the sweet spot. I think you mentioned this too. You, know, you just got to put money in. You don't know where the bottom is. There's only one bottom in the pullback. That's the thing. People, there's only one day it's a bottom. So it, getting it's very, very rare. So you mentioned a couple of names um, and the two names that you mentioned that are up, uh, one of mine, our subscribers are very familiar with, which is Shockwave, which we have in the portfolio. And the other one's Celsius. And, and I want to talk about Celsius with you for a second. Big breakout this week. And, um, you know, the growth stocks are broken out this week, too. You know, you've seen ARC up huge on Tuesday, up 9% with the Dow down a couple hundred points. So you're, we might start be seeing a, the making of a bottom in some of the growth and innovation. But with Celsius, I got to tell you, Jonah, I, I see that stuff everywhere. I don't drink caffeine, so I don't do it. But that shit's everywhere. Don't it's, drink it's amazing caffeine? To me. Hey, you seem like you got no. a lot of energy for a caffeine-free guy. <laughs> exactly. Imagine me on caffeine. That's I stay away from it. So t tell me, about, I mean... Is, is this a company, do you think it's a takeover target? I've heard that from several yes. people. Or is this something where it's like the next monster? Because, you know, the best performing stock in the S&P the last 20 years is monster beverage. Do you think we're in the same situation? Uh, yeah. So Celsius, uh, you are right. You are seeing the product all over the place now compared to a couple of years ago. And that's mostly just because of their, uh, their increase or improvements in distribution. So there's two main business models in, you know, the world of beverages. There's DTR, which is... Uh, when companies are basically sending the product directly to the retailer, either to that store or to their distribution center, and it's typically on the employees to keep the shelves stocked. And that's when companies are just getting started. You know, they're not big enough to really have, you know, uh, national distributors or even regional distributors. And then the way that Celsius has been doing it the last couple of years is called DSD, which is direct store delivery. So that's where you're working with a Coca-Cola, a Pepsi, an Anheuser-Busch, and they have hundreds or thousands of local regional distributors around the country that are bringing product in with their own trucks and they're stocking the shelves and, you know, they get incentivized to, you know, increase sales velocity in locations. Um, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, something interesting happened, bang, which is the number three energy drink company in the, in the US behind Monster and Red Bull, 
decided to leave Anheuser-Busch and go to Pepsi. That forced Pepsi, or if Pepsi wanted to take on Bang, they had to go to Rockstar and buy them out because they had an exclusive with Rockstar. And Rockstar is like the dog piss of the energy drink world. I'm sure Pepsi regrets <laughs> doing that deal years ago and then having to be you know, forced yeah. into a buyout. I mean, just an, a horrible, horrible deal for Pepsi. So they brought in Bang, and then Bang, you know, has been working with Pepsi for the last year and a half, and now Pepsi, and now Bang is in some serious legal trouble. They just lost a couple big court cases. They have to pay a $150 million fine. They've been illegally using the name Bang and some other trademarks, so they have to pay royalties now to other companies. And because of that and some other stuff that the CEO has done, Pepsi just dropped Bang. So now Bang's like left out in the cold without a big distributor. But when but when Bang left Anheuser Busch a couple of years ago, Anheuser Busch came to Celsius and said, "We want to help distribute for you." And over the last couple of years, that's helped Celsius grow their DSD network, that direct store delivery network, to like 250 or 300 you know regional DSD companies, you know Anheuser Busch distributors. Uh, and now they're at like 150 or 160,000 stores, locations. Uh, and just, you know, for instance, like I work, I walk into my local CVS, you know, once a week to grab some stuff. And a year ago, you know, you'd probably see like an entire cool, um, uh, shelf in the coolers of Bang and then like three or four slots of Celsius. And now it's flipped around. Now you see like three or four slots for Bang and you see two full shelves for Celsius. And, you know, that's what's happening all over the country in CVSs, Walgreens, you know, convenience stores, gas stations. They're crushing it at Walmart, Target, Costco. They just brought on Sam's Club and BJ's. So they're doing a lot of things right. And I mean, when a lot of companies in the, you know, cons you know packaged goods space were running into supply chain problems during COVID, I mean, Celsius had their own issues with their supply chain. They had to go overseas and start sourcing their aluminum cans which got expensive and squeezed their margins last year. So you saw their margins come down and the company got punished as a result. But, you know, you've seen some of those problems work their way out. Um, revenue growth is just phenomenal. I mean, they're, they're growing at about 180% right now, year over year in the U.S. International is kind of a, I don't know, a sore spot. I mean, it's just not really growing. But, you know, Europe, Europe is their second largest you know, geography, and we all know what's going on in Europe right now. So, yep. you know, hopefully that stuff gets ironed out in the next couple of years. But what they're doing in the U.S. is really impressive. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers now. And what, what I what I love, you know, with some of the long term stuff is, you know, we talk about the, the software stocks getting you know crushed and, and basically anything growth has gotten crushed the last you know, six to nine months that if you continue to grow revenue during that time, it's, in, it's impressive to me. You know, if you're not a pandemic, but pandemic related type thing. And you look at Celsius, they continue to grow revenue at a huge clip every single year through the pandemic and expected to do so for foreseeable future. So yeah, I, that that's something that's that's been on my radar. But because I hate caffeine, I've been staying away from the damn thing. I've been hurting myself because of that. So, I mean, the other thing, you um, know, I, I've tried to position at least the, you know, the, the, the top one third of my portfolios into stocks that I think can be somewhat recession proof. Like I think Celsius is somewhat recession proof. I mean, it's a $2 can, you know, I mean, unless you lose your job and you know, your income's completely gone and you know, you can't make rent, then yeah, you're probably not going to spend $2 a can on Celsius. But I mean, people go to Starbucks and spend four or $5 on lattes, like it's nothing. So I just feel like, you know, if you are a caffeine addict like me and, and most of America, you know, that $2 yeah. can of Celsius is probably one of the last things you're going to cut out of your budget. So, so I do think it is somewhat of a recession proof stock. And then like my other, you know, my second largest holding, which is Shockwave, which you mentioned earlier. I, I mean, I don't think that's the type of company that is susceptible to a recession. I don't think healthcare and med tech stocks in general are susceptible to a recession, you know, because they're not driven by consumer spending, you know, whether, whether you're filling, you know, whether you're putting $50 or $150 to fill up your gas tank. You know, if your cardiologist says you need to use Shockwave to save your life, you're going to, you know, they're going to use Shockwave to save your life. So. Yeah, ex exactly. 
And again, you look look at their revenue, and you know, 20, oh, no, 2019 no. was forty three, then sixty eight, and then now two thirty seven last year. I mean, that's amazing growth during you know what was a, a shutdown, basically a forced yeah, shutdown I mean, of the world. So that they should grow revenues this year at about ninety percent. Um, you know, incredible margins. I think their gross margins are around eighty five percent. You know, so they're so they're they're not only growing revenues at almost triple digit, but they're now becoming a profitable company. And they'll start to generate some substantial free cash flow going forward. So, you know, those are the stocks I love. Like, I'm not, I'm not an Apple guy. I'm not a Google guy. You know, I feel like their best days are probably in the past. I mean, they're still great companies, but you know, my focus is really those mid cap growth stocks that you know don't get a lot of coverage. Maybe there's two or three analysts that cover them, and if you can really dig in and understand the story and the growth catalysts and create some sort of you know informational advantage like it, like with Celsius you know once I understood yep. what the DSD network really was and how many Anheuser-Busch distributors Celsius could eventually work with and that there's literally like 600 or more you know, like 600,000 stores that could eventually carry Celsius products wow. like two years ago when the stock was trading at 12 or 13 bucks it was the opportunity of a lifetime you know, looking back, I wish it was my only position the last two years because yeah. it's done so much better than every other stock in my portfolio. But yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, this, the software and cloud stocks, I mean, some of them will come back. You know, I mean, I, I'm looking at my portfolio right now. I mean, I really don't own any cloud or, I mean, I own NVIDIA, I own DigitalOcean. Um, but I mean, I've, I've gotten, I got out of most of those names in late 2021 you know, granted, not at the highs, you know, I mean, I, I sold a lot of them, like maybe 20, 25 percent off their all time highs. But, you know, I, I've been out of them for seven or eight months because I was just afraid of that multiple contraction. But I agree. Some of them are starting to look pretty good. If those companies can continue growing, expand margins, generate free cash flow. You know, you've seen a name like CrowdStrike has held up pretty well compared to a lot of the other high growth stocks. I think just because we understand the need for cybersecurity in this world now with, you know, hackers trying to take down every company they can, you know, that's that's a budget item that you're not going to see companies cutting anytime soon. So you brought up NVIDIA and I was at a barbecue on July 4th and, you know, probably you get the same thing. People always ask you about the stock market. What's your favorite stock? I hate that right. question. Like, yeah. I don't have one favorite stock. But, you know, a lot of people say, you know, what's what's one stock you'd buy? And I said, you know. Oh, I tried to give them bigger cap companies because you don't want to tell them something small. And right. NVIDIA kept coming up. I kept saying NVIDIA on the fourth because I look at that stock and my, my, my thought process is, I, you know, I believe in innovation and growth. And if NVIDIA doesn't do well, there's a lot of this innovation that can't happen without NVIDIA. They need NVIDIA. So it's, it's a no brainer if you believe in continued growth of the economy and of innovation for the next 10 years. So you, you have some now. How do you view NVIDIA now? Yeah, I mean, I own a little bit of NVIDIA and I own a little bit of AMD. So, you know, together, that's like four and a half percent of my portfolio. You know, those those two semis, uh, those are the only two semis that I own. I think they're the two best. Uh, I think my third favorite would probably be Qualcomm. Um, but I'm just worried about how tied they are into handsets. And, uh, you know, if we were going into a recession and you see, you know, people cut back on their you know, their iPhone uh, buying, you know, I was afraid Qualcomm would get beat up. But I mean, look at like even Qualcomm. I mean, I think the stock's trading at like 12 times earnings, generates a ton of free cash flow, pays a dividend. Uh, I agree with NVIDIA. I mean, they're they're certainly at the, you know, the forefront of innovation in so many different industries from data centers to AI to robotics to autonomous driving. I mean, they're they're right in the middle of all of it. Um, you know, the stock was probably too expensive last year at 60, 70 yeah. times earnings, whatever it was. I mean, it's always been a stock that's been too expensive. I mean, I missed a lot of that that rise over the last five and 10 years because it was always so expensive. And I felt like I was always chasing it. And I was going to get, you know, that 40, 50 percent haircut that we all dread. Um, and then you finally chase it and you still get a 40 percent haircut. So but I just <laughs> I mean, you know, last year, a lot of people, I mean, I heard some very smart people on CNBC say that they think in five or 10 years, NVIDIA could be the most valuable company in the world, you know, because they are part of so many different industries and segments. So I, I don't know if that actually ends up happening, but I mean, I, I think everyone, any growth investor needs to have some exposure to semis. 
you know, it's probably a, a more cyclical, maybe it's a little bit more cyclical than secular. Um, and I know there's there's fears right now that, you know, we're going to get a semiconductor glut, you know, that companies have been double ordering. But, you know, you hear about these auto companies that still have hundreds of thousands of cars sitting in lots that they can't even sell because they don't even have chips in them yet, which makes me think that yeah. we're really not at that glut stage yet. So... No, I agree with you. I mean, Stellantis came out with earnings this week and, and the stock got crushed on exactly that. They just can't get chips. I mean, I mean European makers, I think, are getting hit a little bit harder than that, uh, than some of the U.S. ones. Um, before I let you go, um, is there a trend or a sector that you're that maybe you haven't jumped into yet that you're doing your research on? Uh, something that you kind of foreseeing that could be your next big move when, when that 30 percent of your cash goes into the market? Uh, to be honest, no. Um, I mean, I I'm sticking with the names that I have right now. I mean, the, I mean, obviously, I'm bullish on Celsius for different reasons. Like, I can't say that I'm bullish on you know beverage stocks or consumer staple stocks. I mean, Celsius is the only one that I really own. I mean, I guess I don't know. Crocs is probably more uh, consumer discretionary than anything else. I just you know, like if you talk to any. Uh, you know, child or teenager or even college kid. I mean, they love their freaking Crocs. Like Crocs is like, you know, has it's this crap. They're so oh, ugly. Oh, they're hideous. I mean, I have two they're the pairs. ugliest looking shoes. But, you know, that's another stock that like I, you know, just like people are not going to cut out their Celsius, regardless of whether we go into a recession. I don't think people are going to stop buying $40 pairs of Crocs because of a recession. They might stop buying the $150 pair of Nikes, I don't think they're going to stop buying, you know, the cheap Crocs. So, you know, the stock's gotten really cheap. It's trading at like six or seven times earnings right now. So, you know, that's a stock that I've been adding to recently. Yeah. Um, but I mean, overall, the sector that I'm probably the most bullish on right now that probably represents the biggest portion of my portfolio is healthcare and med tech, just because I, just because I think they're somewhat recession proof. So Shockwave, Clearpoint Neuro, uh, Lantheus and Moderna are my four healthcare and med tech stocks right now. So Clearpoint, it's funny you mention that because I, I every morning I go through and I share with my team some stocks that are just kind of looking that looking good. Clearpoint came up with very similar pattern here that Celsius has, Jonah, where it broke out last week, kind of confirming that multi month breakout. Boy, that. I don't know much about that company, but man, that chart looks really, really good. Yeah, right so the, I mean, they um, they provide like a a neuro guidance system for uh, neurosurgeons to deliver different drugs and therapeutics to the brain. Uh, and there's like 40 different drug companies that all have drugs in trials right now that would use the Clearpoint system to deliver those drugs if they ever got approved. And a couple of weeks ago, one of their big drug partners did get FDA approval on a drug. And that's sort of what got the stock moving. Uh, and, you know, every one of these drugs that gets approved, I mean, could be, you know, tens of millions of dollars for, you know, in revenue for Clearpoint. And it's sort of the, you know, just like tr uh, Transmedics, which is another company that I've been pretty bullish on, you know, they make those those OCS heart machines or the the organ machines to keep your heart, your lungs, your liver alive during transport from, you know, donor to recipient. Um, you know, they sell those machines to hospitals and then those hospitals have to keep buying the, you know, what they call the consumables, you know, you know, because every time you yeah. bring in a new organ, you can't use the same, you know, guts that was in the last machine, right? You got to replace all the tubes yeah. and everything. And Clearpoint's sort of the same thing. So it's, you know, it's that that razor blade business model, uh, you know, where yep. you sell the the hardware and then you keep selling the consumables, you know, for each use. So, yeah, I mean, Clearpoint's a small great company. business model. Yeah, yeah, great business model. I mean, you do see that a lot in, you know, healthcare or med tech companies. You know, they almost all have that business model. And, you know, once they get FDA approval, you know, that sort of keeps the competition, you know, somewhat out of their their waters. Um, but I think, you know, a company like Clearpoint could certainly be an acquisition target for a, you know, a Medtronic, a Johnson & Johnson, you know, one of those companies could serve even like, you know, an intuitive surgical, which I don't think has a, a history yeah. of acquisitions, but I can see someone like them doing it. You know, small, small company, but yeah. a very, very bright future. 
Make sure everybody follow Jonah, Jonah Lupton at Twitter. Make sure you follow him. He's got a ton of followers. His stuff, I, I've been following for a couple of years now. Great stuff. Thank you so much for coming on because you actually shared ideas. I love when people actually share stocks that you have real money in. So it's awesome, man. We'll get you back soon. We'll talk about this market when it starts breaking out again. And uh, we'll catch up soon. And uh, I will say, good luck to your Celtics, except for when they play my Sixers. That's all I got to <laughs> say. So, <laughs> Nice share with you, Thanks man. so much, John, for coming on. Have a good one. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.